again today we're talking about communication of uh, of our analysis mainly as data scientists um so we have talked for a uh, time about how um, our markdown works more or less and um how code chunks uh, work and yeah the very basics let's say so from now on like uh, chapter 28 is mostly on graphics for communication so i don't know if we need to go thoroughly through every graph and every little detail that the author changes just to show us like different ways we can uh, present and perfect our graphs. Um, it's um, the important part in this chapter is that uh, you need to think about how to create graphics that um, would communicate your results in the most effective way because um, as it has been already said in the previous uh, part of the chapter, um, this is the most important part of your work, right? Like apart from analyzing the things, you have to communicate them somehow to either um, your, your teammates or the decision makers that uh, will use the data. So uh, at first here, uh, we have uh, this book recommendation, The Truthful Art by Albert Cairo. And as this book focuses mostly on how to create effective graphics, and we have some other resources here as well that um, one might check. So I post those in the chat, even though I mean, obviously you can find them uh, in the book too. Um, so as it is pointed out here, um, the author takes uh, for granted that we know uh, like how we would like our plots and uh, things to, to look like. Um, but um, you, we just need to polish them for uh, somebody. Um, so as it also uh, reminds us here, the audience will likely not share our background knowledge. Uh, and this means that we might have to simplify some things to make it easier for them to understand what is going on on their screen or whatever graph they're looking at. Um, so as it is pointed out, you should in, we should invest considerable effort in making the plots as self-explanatory as possible. So uh, somebody should be able to more or less understand what's going on just by seeing the plot uh, without having you there to, to explain everything that is happening. Uh, and we will work with ggplot2 mostly, um, I think exclusively to be nice because I don't remember, I think, or at least most of the things that are happening below are with ggplot2. Uh, so this chapter focuses on the tools that we need to create good graphics. And as I said, assumes like the author that we know what we want and we just uh, need to know how to, to do it. Um, and this is why uh, he recommends us to uh, do a side reading also of the visualization book to be even more competent and understand better what we want to show with our graphs, apart from reading this chapter. So, <clears throat> as I said, we're focusing on ggplot2. Uh, and we will also use a bit deep here for data man manipulation, uh, as well as extension packages as ggdepel and the videos package. Um, okay, so yes, loads here the library libraries. And the first thing that he discusses is labels. So uh, uh, we can add uh, simply. Um, a title on our um, uh, on our plot with the 
labs function of the ggplot. So here uh, in this example plot, we have uh, our gel point and gel smooth without the standard error. And then we have um, labs function called, and we have title equals the title that we want to, to, to show. Uh, and it appears uh, on the top, as we can see. Um, yeah, it's important to, uh, to keep in mind that it's better to avoid titles that just describe the plot, uh, but it's more efficient if uh, the title actually gives a pretty uh, like quick summary of what is the main finding of the plot. So here we have fuel efficiency, uh, efficiency generally decreases with engine size instead of, for example, a scatter plot of engine displacement versus fuel economy. Um, if we need to add more text. Uh, we we can use the um, plot to uh, Yes, we can, we can use other functions like subtitle that adds an additional detail in smaller font and caption, which adds text at the bottom uh, right of the plot and pro usually used to describe the source of the data. Uh, here we have another example that we use again the function labs and we have title, subtitle, and caption, just to see what is happening. So this is like right the title, we have the subtitle, and uh, we also have the caption right here uh, at the bottom. So, right. Also, we can use, as it says, uh, a mathematical equation, equation instead of text strings. And uh, we can just switch the um, uh, equa quotation mark for the quote and read for the available options in plot math. So here we have, for example, X um, equals quote. And then we have the, the equation. And we see that here we have like, the x-axis, we have the, the equation called here. And for the y-axis, we have another equation here. It is kind of cool if you're into math or something. Now, uh, for annotation. Um, it's often useful, as mentioned, to, to label individual observations or groups of, of observations. So instead of just having like a title or a caption or something like that, you might need to point out to the specific uh, observations of the plot. So um, for this, we can use geom text, as it says, is similar to geom point, but it has also an additional aesthetic, which is label. And this makes it uh, possible to add textual labels to your plot, which is kind of cool. Um, so for example, here, uh, we have uh, the ggplot function uh, here, and then we have a geom point that uh, makes, uh, that prints the observations in colors according to their paths. And then we have geom text that uh, adds labels to each situation um, from the models that are um, coded in the data uh, from the data best in class uh, that are uh, defined here. So the, the result is the following plot, which we can see it has like the names of the different models, even though, as we see, they're not very aesthetically pleasing. And as it says, it's hard to read because the labels overlap with each other and with the points. Uh, but we can just switch to geom label, which draws a rectangle behind the text. Uh, and this is the, um, uh, the result. Uh, we can see the geom label 
is here after John Boyd. And also he is nudge uh, why to move the labels slightly above the corresponding points. So just to nudge them a bit to not overlap. And again, this helps a bit, but it's not uh, super pretty again. So there is still um, room for um, to make it better. So for this reason, we can use the GG repel package by Camille uh, Slowoski or Slowoski. And this useful package adjusts the labels automatically so they don't overlap. Uh, so um, the package is called here directly, GGL, Geom Label, GGL, yes. And we have again, label model and data best in class. So we can see here uh, the final result. Uh, the labels are here. Uh, so note that another handy, handy technique is to add a second layer of large hollow points to highlight the points that are labeled. And again, we can use thin legend position plus none to turn the legend off and we will um, restart again. So we can see here. Uh... <clears throat> so, uh... Another thing that one might want to do is just to add a single label to a plot. Uh, but we'll still need to create the data frame. And, and uh, it's convenient to create a new data frame using summarize to compute the maximum values of uh, X and Y. Uh, so this is what uh, he is doing here. So it's label this variable and he summarizes the display and max and uh, the label is increased engine is related to decrease material economy so notice here that the title appears in two lines and this is uh, manually done by using the um, uh, backslash and n and uh, yeah, this way he uh, separates the, the quote into, uh, into different lines. And uh, here we have the John text again, and we have label equals label. So he calls the data frame that he created. And uh, we also get the label here. Uh, also, if we want to place text exactly on the borders of the plot, we can use a plus inf or minus inf. Um, and uh, we can use also table to create the data frame. Okay, inf and uh, hwy. Uh, and the label is again the same. We can see um, the output over here. So, um, yeah, we can also automatically add line breaks uh, given the number of characters we want per line. So this way we can, uh, as it says, define the width. So width equals 40 means that uh, we will just print 40 characters per line. 
Um, and indeed, we see that here uh, it does the, um, the line separation label automatically. This is just to do it without having to insert the backslash N that I talked about before. Um, right. Okay, uh, this is just uh, a picture in the book, but um, more like a plot that uh, shows all nine combinations of A just and B just, just how like where the, um, um, the points will appear in the plot if you use um, different, yeah, the different uh, the combinations. So, and here before moving to the scales, we have just uh, additional uh, alternatives to uh, geom text, just to um, make them, just to have like few extra recommendations if you want to add labels in our text, in our plots, like geom h line and geom v line to add reference lines and geom rect to draw like a rectangle around the points of interest. Um, and we can define the boundaries with the X, mean, max, and uh, not Z, uh, Y, max, and mean. Then we also have geom segment um, that we can, uh, with which we can uh, say like, uh, define a point with an arrow. Uh, yeah, the only limit, as it says here, is your imagination and yeah, your patience with positioning the annotations. So kind of <laughs> uh, true too. Uh, so now moving to the scales. Um, uh, obviously, you can do um, can change the scaling of a plot to make it more clear. Um, uh, Digiplot usually, uh, not usually, normally, uh, by default, um, adjusts the scales for you. Uh, for example, uh, here, uh, as it says that the, we see that the scaling is done automatically given the numbers that we have for uh, the y-axis and the x-axis. Um, yeah. Uh, and here. All right, so here we see scale x continues. So th this, is, this is done by default. We don't have to do it. Here he does it just to show what is happening behind the, ski, the, the scenes and uh, scale Y continues and scale color discrete. Um, as it says here, the naming scheme for scales is scale and um, uh, bottom lower item. And um, yeah, and then the, the scale is followed by the name of the of the aesthetic and the name of the scale. Um, so we might, for whatever reason, need to uh, underscore. Yes, thank you. This is the right, the correct. Uh, so we might need to tweak some of the parameters in the default scale um, just to change breaks or axes or the key legends how they appear. And uh, we might as well uh, want to replace the scale together by using it uh, and use a completely different algorithm, as it says. It depends on the data and what we exactly want to show. Uh, so here we have um, uh, axis sticks and leads and keys. Um, so add uh, breaks um, that control the position of the ticks or the values uh, associated with the different keys. Um, so labels controls the text label associated with each key or T. 
key, like here. And the most common use of breaks is to override the default choice. So here, what he does is he uh, points out that he wants to change something in scale um, or the y-axis that is to use. And he calls out breaks that equals 50, 40, and is um, by five. And here we can see the result. It starts from 15, ends at 40, and we have five. Um, and this scaling is by five. And uh, we can use labels in the same way, uh, but we can also use null to suppress labels altogether if we don't want any enabled, uh, labels to appear. So here we have for scale, uh, for, for scale x continuous labels equals null, and the same for scale y continuous. So here we don't have any uh, label. And as you can see here that we don't have numbers denoting the scale numbers. And you can, we can also use breaks and labels to control the appearance of the legends. Um, and axes are used for X and Y aesthetics too. And legends are used for everything else, for everything else we have uh, in the plot, we, we have as a legend in the plot. Another use of breaks uh, is when we have a relatively few data points and we want to highlight exactly where the observations occur. And uh, for example, here, what he does um, is that we have uh, uh, its ID number, and then we have Geo segment, and then we have scale X date, so it's like the year. We have breaks equals presidential start. Date labels is percent of uh, Y, and here is the result. So we have the presidential, I think, um, elections or something like that. So the data label, date labels, takes a format specification in the name for formats, parse and data date time. So here uh, is actually the year that is old and Data breaks uh, that are not shown here um, take strings of two days or one month. Date breaks. Yes, yeah, so this is like a different way to, um, to, to call labels for date and date time scale. Uh, now for legend layout. Uh, to begin with, we can choose theme. We will see themes uh, in the following subchapter. And um, we can also control the known data parts of the plot um, with, um, for example, here we have uh, base plus theme legend position left. And yeah, we have uh, the we, we're basically saying um, where and how we want this stuff to appear. So here we have it in the yes on the left. Here we have the um, the information of the, of the legends the legends on the top and here on the top on bottom and here on the right. Uh, you, we can use also legend position equals none to suppress actually to display the legend altogether. 
Um, we can also use uh, the guides function as, a, as well as the guide legend or a guide color bar. And um, this way, uh, as it says, uh, we may present many points on a plot. For example, here, uh, we have theme legend for you to bottom, and then we have guides, color equals guide legend, and the number of rows equals one, override the setting in uh, size four. So here we can see on the bottom the, um, the legend with the different classes, um, and uh, this way uh, whoever checks the plot can understand uh, what its observation is uh, about. Now, about replacing a scale, um, there are ways to actually replace a scale altogether, um, either if we're talking about continuous position scales and polar scales. Um, a way to do that. Uh, example, if we log transport them, here we have log transform the, 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 the diamonds data. So first we have this plot, uh, the first one that is like the general one the, with the price and the carat. And here we log transform both the crud and the price, and this is the, the new plot. The disadvantages though are that um, the axes are now labeled with transforming values, and it's hard to interpret the plot. And this is true uh, in general when you do these kind of transformations, but um, sometimes they make the graph look kind of uh, better, but on the other hand, the, the scale, um, yeah, the scale uh, legends are not as easy to interpret. Uh, so another way is uh, to uh, to just replace scale. So here we have diamonds, aesthetic, crat, price, and then we just add the, the scale replacement, but we see that here that the labels uh, remain the same. And we can also customize uh, scale by uh, with different uh, coloring. And uh, the default categorical scale picks colors that are evenly spaced around the color wheel. Um, but we have also different types of uh, coloring, color combinations if we want to be more creative. For example, we have the color viewer scales, which have been um, uh, also seem to work better with people with color blindness. I didn't know that actually. And um, also, So this is the here this is the, the plot with our general uh, colors and here is the one with the color viewer uh, color viewer wheel uh, using palette uh, set one. Um, so we can also, as it says. Uh, use black and white if this is easier for us. Um, and usually uh, just a few colors may do the job. So we don't have to be very, very color precise. And we have also the documentation of the color brewer uh, colors here. And uh, yeah, here it points out the package that uh, is associated with them. And we also have a list 
of the different palettes. And here we can see all the different available from the color bluer scales. And so we can use also, um, as it says, if we have predefined mapping between values and colors, we can use the scale color, color manual. And uh, this way we can actually um, uh, paint, but use specific colors for specific observations. So here, for example, we have a uh, scale color manual for uh, values, Republican as red and Democratic as blue. Here uh, for the different uh, values that we have uh, different colors according to they are Republican or uh, Democratic. Um, we also have scale color gradient or scale field gradient um, for continuous color scaling. And this um, gives us the possibility to have uh, positive or uh, negative uh, values with different, different colors. And this is sometimes useful if we, if we want to distinguish points uh, above or below the mean. And another pretty cool uh, uh, package is the scale color uh, VDDIS function that is provided by the VDDIS package. And uh, it's a continuous analog of the categorical color view, viewer scales. Uh, here we can see an example of using this um, so this is also a, another possibility. Uh, here we have uh, the basic um, first one is the basic plot. And meanwhile, the, the other calls the this package and the scale field this. And again, Uh, the color scales are available both in the UK and US spelling. So another uh, aspect of our plot that we may want to uh, to change is zooming. Uh, so uh, we might want to adjust the data that we have plotted or set limits to scale or um, for example, set X limb and uh, Y limb. And we will see how we can do this. Uh, so here at first we can uh, just use Ford Cartesian uh, to zoom uh, in a, at a specific region of our plot. So here we have here. And um, there, uh, five. Uh, seven and ten to thirty, and this is the result. Or uh, in the second, second case, filter so as to display um, So, yeah, it just plays with the zooming a bit. Gets a, a, most, a more um, zoomed plot in the second piece here. And uh, we can also set limits on individual scales. And uh, this is probably, uh, this is, uh, we are able to do it by subsetting the data. And it is usually more useful if we, if we expand the limits. Uh, for example, if we know uh, scales across different plots. And yeah. 
So here we have that there's one for age degrees and one for COVID. Oh, you can't see the screen. Is it okay now? Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, all right. So we can plot the two classes of cars separately, uh, but this way is difficult to compare all three um, plots because the scales are different. If we see here, we have uh, 12 to 4, and here we have 25 to 3. So they're not really comparable and it's hard. So uh, we can actually solve this problem by sharing scales across multiple plots by training the scales with the limits of the full data. So uh, what we can do here is to uh, call separately for, for the scale. And as we see, uh, we have now uh, comparable scaling for both uh, the x-axis and the y-axis for compact and SUV cars. And uh, yeah, uh, as it says, um, this technique is useful more generally. Uh, if you want to spread plots in, uh, in multiple pages of a report. Now about themes, uh, if we want to customize non-data elements, as it was mentioned before, um, you can use a theme. Use the and we can check uh, all the, the things here. As it says, uh, there are many many options in the GG themes packages. Um, and uh, here is just a um, showcase of the different uh, themes. And yeah, and here is just uh, an interesting um, explanation of why the default theme in R is a uh, gray background. And it says that it was a deliberate choice because this way the data kind of um, uh, seemed to be uh, more uh, visible while the grid lines are, all, are also visible. And, um, and this is uh, how to say like this is sometimes beneficial when you want to uh, add position judgments for some reason. Uh, so um, yeah, this is the reason, the main reason that uh, gray background was default, uh, and yeah, ensures that the the plot is uh, perceived as a visual entity, a single visual entity. So now uh, moving to the ways that we can save our plots. There are two main ways. The one is the ggsave, and the other is the NITAR, uh, the basic. Uh, so ggsave will save the most recent plot to disk. Uh, for example, here we have like this plot. Then we we ggsave my plot PDF. Note that you just uh, that you have also to. Uh, pull out the, the type of file that you want it to be saved as. Um, so uh, important uh, as well is uh, that if you if we don't specify the width and the height uh, that we want for our plot, it will be taken from the dimensions of the current plotting device. Uh, so to be um, to create plots exactly as we want them and to, as it says, to produce re reproducible code. We want to specify them just to be sure that whoever runs the code uh, will get the, a singularly saved plot. Um, and uh, as it says, uh, 
and you can also learn more about GGSAVE in the documentation for R. Now about figure sizing, we have fig width, fig height, and fig asp, and uh, out width and out height. And um, so this is a bit tricky because image sizing uh, is uh, has two sizes, like the size of the figure created by R and the size uh, at which is, is inserted in the output document. And there are also different dimensions that we should take into uh, consideration. And here just points out for what are he, his preferences for uh, um, using the, for saving the plots. And so, yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes, as it says, if you find that you're having to screen to read the text in the plot, you need to tweak big width. And this way, uh, the, the plot will be larger on the final doc. Um, and the text uh, will be too small. If big width is smaller, the text will be too big. And again, you need to experiment a bit to sometimes get the perfect size. Um, yeah. So uh, you also have to remember that uh, when you um, uh, when you nudge out width, you also need to adjust big width to maintain the same ratio. Um, in your uh, with your default output for the output of the document. Now, other important options: if big show holds, uh, which puts the plots are after the code when uh, is missing. And um, as it says, as he says. Um, when you mix code uh, and text, this might be useful because it forces you to break large blocks of code because you have to explain what exactly uh, you're showing uh, with a plot. And um, you can also use a big cap to add a, cap a caption to, to the plot. Uh, again, if you're producing a PDF uh, output when you're needing uh, your document, uh, the default graphic type is PDF. And this is a good uh, default because uh, PDFs are high, high quality uh, vector graphics. However, you can produce very large and slow plots um, if you have very um, or as it says, displaying thousands of points, for example. So this, uh, in this case, you might want to set uh, dev equals uh, PNG to force uh, the use of PNG instead uh, in your needing. Uh, and also it's a good idea to name code chunks that produce figures um, because this way you'll be easier, you, to spot them out, as we have already said. And again, uh, if you want to learn more about ggplot, he points to the book ggplot2, uh, elegant graphics for that analysis. And uh, there is also this uh, gg extension gallery that somebody can check out. So <clears throat> our markdown formats. Um, what uh, we can uh, basically, what we can produce, what types of documents we can produce with our markdown. Uh, by default, uh, it is produced to you for to produce HTML uh, documents, and but we can change this by either modifying the YAML header. For example, here we have a HTML document. Or uh, we can also do it, uh, if we change it here in the YAML, this will change it permanently, permanently, meaning that every time we hit meet, 
you will get an HTML document, but if we want to use it transiently, we can just call in armor down, uh, double colon and render. And yeah, uh, we can uh, uh, say like, uh, point out to the specific document, um, our markdown document that we want, and then call the output format that we want, for example, doc, Word document. And um, again, this is useful if you want to produce multiple types of outputs. Um, yeah, of course, we have also the, the neat button here that we can just click and it will automatically um, render the R Markdown document to whatever format we want. So what, what are the output uh, options? Um, so we can... Uh, uh, we can all override the default parameter valuable values. Uh, for example, we can use HTML document, talk, talk flow two. And by this, um, you remember what this does though. Yeah, uh, I know. Check it out. So, so. Um. Ah, okay, so uh, this function actually uh, has to do with the table of contact contents. So this is like the uh, true is that you have it or load again. And as it says, you can list different outputs. So you, uh, for example, you can have also an HTML and also a PDF document output. And now uh, what type of documents we can create? Uh, we have uh, variations, different, different types of documents like PDF document, Word document, ODT document or open documents uh, or yeah, like uh, open office and stuff like that. RTF documents, reads format text documents. I don't know what exactly they are uh, used for. Oh, ah, nice. This is for the table of contents. Yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, we also can create uh, an MD document, obviously that is a markdown document, even though this is not typically useful. Uh, and we also can create a GitHub document. Uh, and again, uh, we can uh, turn off the display, the default display of code by setting the global option, uh, um, I'd say like, uh, chunk options set uh, equal equals false. In this way, uh, the code will not appear at all, just the output of our um, analysis. And for out HTML documents, uh, we can also do uh, this. We can also add this, this code here, which uh, we will have the, a folding code chunk. So if you want, click on it and see the code chunk or so notebooks um, and is a variation of an HTML document. And uh, as it says, the, the output is very similar, but the, um, uh, the use is very different. Uh, so usually you use notebooks to collaborate with other data scientists. And um, can either use it on the web browser or you can edit in RStudio. Um, 
And also, as it says, in the future, you will be able to include supporting files like CSV data files uh, that will be automatically extracted when needed. Um, and uh, yeah, the uh, ND uh, dot HTML files is a way to share analysis with your colleagues. Uh, so it might be a good thing to, but but as it says, things can get painful if you if people many people want to make changes, and this is where GitHub actually and Git comes handy because you can have version control and uh, you can have a team working on a on a code uh, document, um, and uh, you can see who does what. And you can also insert comments for the changes and it. Uh, so here you have HTML document default and then GitHub document default to, um, to use both outputs. Um, and then you can share the file by email. Um, Can also create presentations with our markdown and um, you get less visual control than uh, with keynote or powerpoint but uh, it's uh, useful because uh, you can automatically insert the results of your r code into the presentation and this saves a huge amount amounts of time and you can also uh, divide the content into slides um, uh, a new slide starting with uh, uh, has a Python uh, and the second with uh, two and uh, way you can also have like the different headers. Uh, you can also have an horizontal rule by using the three asterisks and create uh, this way uh, a slide without a header. Um, so these are the three presentation formats we'll be in our markdown, iOS presentations, iOS slide presentations, slide presentations, and Beamer presentation. I've never used the uh, our markdown for presentations, but yeah, in case you, you want to find out more, um, check uh, here the links, the different um, uh, packages for this. The last thing that you can create with R is uh, dashboards uh, that are useful to communicate large amount of information, kind of like visually and quickly. And um, yeah, for example, you can see here uh, a dashboard and you can, um, uh, we can see here an example of the um, of the code used to create this here. Uh, again, uh, we see that for, uh, for output, we have flex dashboard, uh, double colon, and then flex dashboard. And we have the different, uh, different plots and we get these. Um, okay, so um, we may have uh, interactive components, especially if we use our, um, output. Uh, so you can use HTML widgets. And yeah, here we have the many packages that you can use uh, these. And you can also have Shiny uh, apps that are uh, that provide client side interactivity. Uh, so uh, in this case, all interactivity happens in the browser independently of R. And this is kind of cool because you can distribute HTML code without any connection to R. Um, uh, but that, as it says, fundamentally, what you can do. Okay. 
I, I hope I, I hope you're back. I mean, it's just just a tiny bit before the end. Bear with sure. me. I'm so sorry. I might I need to take three minutes extra. Um, yeah, so we were here that you can also use Shiny. Uh, that is another cool way to have an interactive output. And um, yeah, you can also have uh, 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 interactions uh, in the browser this way. And um, yeah, so you, you can learn more about Signy. Uh, also, you can use R Markdown for, to create websites. Um, and simply by having like um, uh, the YAML file named uh, sites in the YAML. For example, name my website and uh, navbar title my website and blah, 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 the different uh, sections of the website you want to build. And then you can use armor down uh, double colon red render site to build the site or directory of files ready to deploy a standalone uh, static website. Again, uh, for website um, uh, information, you can check this out. And uh, then we can also have like the different uh, packages, for example, for, for even more output format, the book down that is usually used for books. So for example, the R4 data science book uses this. Pretty Doc, which provide lightweight document formats, and the uh, articles package that has a selection of formats for specific journals. And again, um, uh, we have some recommendations for uh, extra reading and um, to uh, better even more our communication skills. And the last part is the workflow for Arma Down, which again um, uh, actually we have some recommendations uh, by by the authors uh, about like uh, how to use effectively Arma Down. It reminds us that we want to record what we did and why we did it. Um, because we, even if we need to check out uh, what we have done in the past, we will need the explanation. Uh, we, uh, the, this reporting will support our rigorous thinking. Um, and uh, this is why uh, as you record your thoughts as you go, uh, you will most definitely come up with a stronger analysis and you will save time uh, when you're sharing your analysis with others. And it, you will also help others understand your work when you record uh, your thoughts as well. And uh, a lab notebook sometimes is very useful uh, to, to share not only what you've done, but why you did it. And again, we have some advice about lab notebooks here that you can check if you want. And again, we have uh, some uh, uh, advice about um, our, our naming the notebook. We would better have a descriptive title and an evocative file name. And also to use the YAML field to record the date because this is also useful. Um, he suggests like the author to use the, this uh, date format because this reduces ambiguity. Um, and, and yeah, um, last uh, pieces of advice is that, yeah, if we spend a lot of time on, on an analysis idea, uh, we should never delete it, but write up a brief note about it and we can come up back later. Um, um, uh, we can also uh, need record a small snippet of data uh, by using uh, this function here. 
cover an error in data file, never modify directly, write code to correct the value instead. Uh, and also, um, uh, before finishing the day, make sure that you can meet the notebook uh, and fixing any problems as the code is fresh in your mind. This is quite important because otherwise you may uh, forget what you were doing. And um, yeah, if you need to track versions of packages that you use, he suggests using the pack track or the checkpoint that saves the packages used in your code. And um, yeah, also uh, uh, in, you are also advised to store the notebooks in individual problems, uh, individual projects and coming up with a good uh, naming sim as this way you, it would be easier to, um, uh, I have to say, like to, to find them in the future. And uh, here we have like also a new uh, alternative to uh, our markdown, which is Porto. And this is a kind of cool, like um, I'd say cousin, I would say of our markdown. It's from the same guys that created our studio. And it's a notebook that uh, you can use also for, not only for R, but it works seamlessly with Python and JavaScript and other um, languages. And I think the new R for Data Science book actually will have like a new chapter using these, that the Porto instead of the R Markdown for communication, which is kind of interesting. I haven't used it before, but uh, I briefly checked it out and it looked cool. So this is it. This is the end. <laughs> I hope it was not like too, uh, how to say, um, uh, I, I was, I just tried to make it as short as possible. Again, it's the communication part is a bit tricky because it's more on you experimenting with your data than anything else. But yeah, it was a kind of uh, demonstration of what you can do with armor down. All right. I mean, it's fantastic, Joanne. Mean, thank, thanks very much for, for sticking with this. I'm very happy. Yeah, that we... thank you. Thank you as well for sticking around until the end. <laughs> it was a bit painful, but we did it. We did it, yay. So <laughs> I will let John know that we're finished. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mary. Okay, thank you. See you, Daniel. All the best.